It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. William Bickerton was a coal miner from England who immigrated to the United States and joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 1845. Without ever having met the church's founding prophet, Bickerton soon came to see himself as Joseph Smith's true heir, leading what came to be called the Church of Jesus Christ, but more commonly referred to as the Bickertonites. Today, they're the third largest church tracing its lineage back to Joseph Smith, and in this episode, Bickerton's biographer Daniel P. Stone joins us to talk about William Bickerton's fascinating and ultimately tragic life. Stone calls Bickerton a forgotten prophet, and he's not referring to the memories of members of the Salt Lake-based church. Stone says in many ways Bickerton has been forgotten in his own movement. Questions and comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. Our review of the month comes from Gary Ricks. He wrote one of the best compliments I've seen. He said, every interview that I've listened to has been interesting, even when I thought beforehand that the subject matter wouldn't be of interest to me. Thanks for that, Gary. You can rate and review the show in iTunes. It helps us spread the word. And now, Daniel P. Stone on William Bickerton. Welcome, Daniel. Hey, thanks for having me. It's nice to have you here. We're talking about a new biography that you just wrote called William Bickerton, Forgotten Latter-day Prophet. William Bickerton founded the third largest of the Restoration Movement churches, so churches that, that trace their lineage back to Joseph Smith, and his is the third largest of that group, and he lived a long life. He passed away when he was 90 years old in, in 1905, and he made an interesting request for his funeral that I wanted to begin with, because you begin your book with this request. He asked an apostle in his church to read from the 19th chapter of Job at his funeral. What was the significance of having that scripture read? Well, the significance of that is we well know the book of Job in the Bible is one of the saddest books of the Bible. It's not your common funeral sermon. And uh, when uh, William Bickerton asked the Apostle Alan Wright to read that, he felt like Job. And he even wrote that in the newspaper in Kansas on his 90th birthday. He said, I feel like Job, that the balance of my life, I will wait until my change comes. And that was really significant because he felt that the only way he was going to get vindication was unlike Job, who got vindication before he died and he got, you know, twice as much as he had. William Bickerton felt the only way he was going to get vindication is when he died and that God would, in a sense, basically say, like, well done, my good and faithful servant, you know, and he would get vindication in the afterlife. Who was he seeking that vindication from? I mean, he was the leader. Uh, he, he initiated this movement. Uh, mm -hmm. Why would he need vindication then? That's basically the tragedy of the story is William Bickerton is considered the prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ or the Bickertonite movement. And there was this allegation of infidelity. And eventually what ends up happening is the church splits up for 22 years. It doesn't really seem that he was an adulterer, but that's the story that carries on throughout the narrative of the Bickertonite history. That's even what's really within the, chur the church's official records or the official history books. So to kind of see at the end of his life feeling that he eventually does, the church eventually does come back together with the help of William Bickerton because he does take a step down. He does really have to swallow a pill of humility, something he didn't want to do and just kind of lose his status as the leader of the movement. But he thought everything was okay. And when he tries to kind of write this autobiography of himself, everything's kind of just quietly tucked away. And he realizes that he knew and he had a strong premonition that his story probably would not be told. So even in Job 19, there's a part where it says, my kinsfolk have failed and my familiar friends have forgotten me. And then it says, oh, that my words were now written, that they were printed in a book, that they're graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. So he's basically using Job's words and adopting them to say, my people are forgetting about me. I'm going to be forgotten. Please, someone tell my story. And I never knew that getting into the, it, it was in the middle of research. I actually found that out mm. and it blew me away. So Job 19 is a very sad story that he would even ask that to be read at his funeral. But it really was kind of like a cry decor from the grave saying, please, someone tell my story. Yeah, and the reason I wanted to start with that question is I want people to know from the beginning that William Bickerton's story is in a lot of ways a tragedy. He led a, a Latter-day Saint movement uh, similar to the RLDS Church or the mm -hmm. Salt Lake-based Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. His movement was called the Church of Jesus Christ, but it wasn't an easy thing for him to do. And at the end, there was some tragedy involved. So we'll come back around to that um, for sure. tell his story. 
the LDS Church is based in Salt Lake City. This is the largest of the restorationist movements. There are about 16 million members listed. And then the RLDS Church, which is now the Community of Christ, has a quarter million members. Mm -hmm. Bickerton's Church counts about 25,000 members in 23 different countries. So despite being the third largest of, of all of these groups, your book is the first full-length approach to William Bickerton. Why do you think that his uh, tradition has been overlooked in scholarship on Mormonism in general? Yeah, that's a great question. I've been wondering that the same thing. Um, I grew up in the Bickertonite Church, and I got into American history, especially American religious history, and I loved it. And then I thought about, oh, and then once you start kind of growing up and realizing, oh, my church played a role within American religion, and it was fairly significant. And you start looking at the literature, and there's barely anything. Uh, Gary Entz, who was uh, got his PhD from University of Utah, he wrote two really good articles on the Bickertonite movement, but mostly in Kansas. And I read his articles. Articles, and I got more out of those articles than I did out of my own church's, you know, actual heritage history. And William Bickerton isn't mentioned very much at all. And that really kind of was a, a light bulb moment of going, wait a minute. It seems that the church really focuses on him. I mean, within the larger Latter Day Saint movement, we're called the Bickertonites, right? And then it just seemed that it just seems strange that how come he's not being mentioned when. The doctrines and the name of the church and how we started really kind of hinges on him. And that's why I really wanted to look more into and realizing early on that, you know, the what ends up happening is there is this the his biggest rival was the president of the of the Quorum of Twelve, who eventually ends up taking over the church, and his name was Within the Church of Jesus yeah, Christ. Yeah, within the, the Church of, of Jesus 12, Christ. Yeah. yeah. And his name's William Cadman. And in the actually the first church official church history was actually written by William Cadman's son named William H. Cadman. So once I kind of started piecing things together, I started realizing, oh, wait a minute, there is a family line here where they're also trying to, I don't know if it was malicious in a sense, but they're trying to kind of keep a clean history. They want to make their father look good and they don't want to bring up things in the past that really happened that could look bad upon Bickerton or, you know, William Cadman Sr., William H.'s father. So that was the first official uh, church heritage history. The second volume goes a little bit more into it, but again, it's very sparse that William Bickerton's mentioned. So I really- Were these written in the early- 1900s? Or? Yeah, the first book was written in 1945. Oh, okay, so mid-century. Yeah, and then the second one was written, I believe, in 2002. It was published. Hmm. So you see this huge, you know, these major gaps, and it, it's just been carried on. So really, I kind of blame the Bickertonite Church in a sense, not in a mean way, but in the sense that they never really actually looked at their history. And there have been, there were, and once I started going into the documents, I did realize there were attempts early on to kind of bring out more of the history. Mm. And it was always kind of either squashed or kind of put down or tucked away. Because I think like all religious institutions, people are sometimes can be afraid of their own history, especially if it's never been written. Because even though they don't know what's in it, they're instantly afraid and they get guarded and say, well, we don't, we don't want anything bad to come out. So I think that's really part of it. And the archives of the church have never really been organized in a sense. They've gotten a lot better, but they have never really opened them to the public. And I know there were certain attempts to do that and it never really happened. So really, it's, it's really, it's really ironic that it's the third largest Latter-day Saint movement. And yet out of all the movements of the Latter-day Saint tradition, William Bickerton has been the one that has been least written about. And it's in part because his own people, the, those who followed after him, sort of left him out to some extent. So research that's gone back and looked at the Bickertonites, if they approach it through Bickertonites' own history, <laughs> there would be a gap there. Did you feel that trepidation at all that you mentioned? Like that sometimes when you go back and look at history, it can be a little unsettling. You grew up within the tradition yourself. Yeah, thanks for asking that because I actually had no trepidation after reading Richard Bushman's Rough Stone Rolling, that was a really major impact in my life because after reading that and what Bushman talks about, just you know, looking at the history objectively and as a historian and realizing that, you know what, if there's truth, you shouldn't be afraid of it. I really took that and said, that's beautiful. That's what I want to do. And I want to be a historian. I'm, I'm still a believing scholar, but I wanted to be objective. And I just wanted to tackle it head first and say, what happened? And just try to bring it out. And that's why I kind of started the book with Job 19, because it was unbelievable that William Bickerton even had that premonition to know that 
his story probably was going to be tucked away. And that's where I thought this story has to be told. So like you said, in a sense, it's a tragedy, but in a lot of ways, it's inspiring and dispiriting at the same exact time. So what audiences did you have in mind for this biography as you wrote it? It was published by Signature Books. It just came out. Who did you have in mind? Did you want the, the Academy to look at this, Mormon Studies people, your own tradition? Yeah, all the above. I really tried to write the book in a sense where people would not know that I'm a believer. Now, I do mention that in the introduction that I am, but I was really hoping that it could reach a wide audience. I wanted it to be scholarly, but at the same point, I wanted it to be lucid enough where anybody could read it, that they could just pick it up and understand it. And even if you didn't know anything about the Book of Mormon or the Latter-day Saint tradition, I wanted other scholars and other people just outside the Latter-day Saint movement to be able to pick it up, understand the restoration story and where William Bickerton fit within that. There's a sense in which in the LDS tradition, revisionist history or revisiting history has been controversial in the past. The church itself is beginning to come to terms with some of the more difficult aspects of LDS history, looking at things like the Mountain Meadows Massacre or uh, race and the priesthood and, and these types of questions. Uh, but it's been a painful and long process. How about within your tradition? Will your book have similar responses there where people feel like it's sort of uh, trying to wrest control of the narrative of the church in ways that aren't good or anything like that? That's a great question, Blair. I don't know. I'm hoping that they just look at it and realize that, wow, our history really never has been told to begin with. And maybe that excites people's interest. There were some troublesome things in there, but nothing that personally, I, I mean, I'm a believing scholar, nothing I found in there that was faith shattering. The biggest issue that I had heard, even but while writing the book, especially from some of the leadership, and understandably so, they are worried about the William Bickerton and William Cadman feud because that is something that really has not been talked about quite a bit, especially within our church. And even though Bickerton's family, believe it or not, I don't even know if there even is a Bickerton I, or a real a direct descendant of William Bickerton in the church anymore. I'd have to look. I know there was one a while back, but I'm not sure anymore. But there are still a lot of direct descendants of William Cadman. So, you know, there's also family heritage that has to be protected sometimes. And my approach was, you know what, I'm I'm neither a direct descendant of William Cadman or William Bickerton. I'm one of those Italian Americans that came into the Bickertonite church, <laughs> and I come from that line. So the, the Italians kind of had a major influx in the early 20th century. So that's where I come from. So I came from this as a just what actually happened. And I love biography. Most when you look at biography, most Americans read biography rather than regular history books. So I really thought, you know what, the best way to approach this is just to look at William Bickerton life and knowing that if I looked at his life, the church's history would also be talked about in unison. So I thought it, I was hoping it would be a good approach and that people would be interested in it. What were the biggest questions that drove your research when you very first began? You already mentioned that some things you discovered really surprised you along the way. What was driving you to begin with? The big thing that was driving me to write this was William Bickerton's vision of the mountain and chasm. I was enthralled by that as a uh, as a young Bickertonite reading that. That's how basically our movement got started. So when William Bickerton eventually leaves the LDS church, he says that he has this vision where he's carried away in the spirit and placed on a high mountain. And in one of the accounts, it says that there was just room enough for him to stand. And the, the interpretation I got from the vision was that he felt that God was telling him, listen, you know, William, you're on a good track. This is where you are. Keep, I know it's tough, but stay on this track. And then he saw a chasm below that was, he said the sight thereof was awful. And he felt that if he didn't stay on this path, he would fall into that chasm. So that's what really drove me. Cause then I thought that's really profound that he was a devout Latter-day Saint, a part of the LDS church. And then he has this amazing vision. And then that would drive him. I mean, he was a coal miner. He was uneducated. He was not, now that it's the third largest Latter-day Saint church, he is not, he never knew Joseph Smith. He was not a part of the original church. So out of the six major claimants that, you know, after Joseph Smith's death, William Bickerton comes a little bit after in 1845, he's converted to the Latter-day Saint movement. And now he's, his church is the third largest. So that's what really drove me was going, what is his story? How does this even come about? Because he doesn't have that direct connection to Joseph Smith in a sense. So how could he claim this prophethood to the Latter-day Saint movement when he was never technically a part of it when Joseph Smith was alive? So it sort of reminds me of an LDS history, Joseph Smith's first vision where he goes into the what's now called the Sacred Grove. He says that he beholds a vision of God the Father and Jesus Christ, and they instruct him to join no church, and, and then he proceeds to have more revelations after that. 
is the mountain vision of William Bickerton, does that play a similar role in, in the Bickertonite faith then as sort of this founding moment? Absolutely. That's the pivotal moment. There's a lot of similarities if you just kind of look at it objectively when you compare Joseph Smith to William Bickerton. There's a lot of similarities. And that's what William Bickerton was trying to do. You know, we kind of, Latter-day Saints often call their movement the Restoration Movement. Well, William Bickerton, in a sense, was trying to recover the Restoration because he felt that things had kind of gone astray. So you kind of see that same line with Joseph Smith where he's trying to figure out, well, which church do I join? And then he has that vision of the first vision, 1820, where God tells him, don't join any of them. We're going to, I'm going to use you to establish the, the right church. And William Bickerton with that vision of mountain and chasm is kind of saying the same thing, saying, listen, you're on a good path. Stay where you are. I'm going to help you create or recover the church. So there's a lot of similarities in their mentalities. Okay. So, so far we've kind of been given a lot of interesting details and things that I think a lot of listeners are probably unfamiliar with. And so it might be dizzying to try to take all this in. So let's, let's kind of get back to the beginning here and, and try to take people through the sweep of the Church of Jesus Christ's history. And we'll be referring to them as, uh, as Bickertonites. It's not an offensive term. It's not the preferred term. But uh, as you told me before the interview, Bickertonites are like, yeah, that's fine. You can, you can use that. It's nice and short. But the Church yeah. of Jesus Christ <laughs> is the official name. Uh, we're talking with Daniel P. Stone today. He's completing his PhD in American Religious History at Manchester Metropolitan University in England. And we're talking about the new biography from Signature Books, William Bickerton, Forgotten Latter-day Prophet. Okay, so let's go to William Bickerton's conversion. You said he never met Joseph Smith. What brought him to Mormonism? Talk about those circumstances. Sure. William Bickerton was an English immigrant. He moves to America in 1831, and he grew up in the Northumberland County area. Uh, and when he moves, he lands in New York City. He eventually moves to West Virginia, gets a job as a coal as a coal miner, ends up meeting his wife. They have a they have a son. And you can kind of see the circumstances of his, of his life. He's trying, coal miners back then did not get paid very well. It was a really You're hard. you kidding. Yeah. <laughs> it was a really hard and rough job. So Pittsburgh at that time, around 1844, he moves to Pittsburgh. And this is what makes it so interesting is because this is when Joseph Smith is murdered, right? So the American press was going crazy trying to report it. And what made Pittsburgh such an interesting thing with the, with the Latter-day Saint movement was that that's where Sidney Rigdon was. So the newspapers were exploding not only about Joseph Smith, but talking about Sidney Rigdon. And Sidney Rigdon was the first counselor of the first presidency under Joseph Smith at this time, but Correct. had been sort of in, in limbo a little bit. He was disconnected from Joseph Smith, but he mm -hmm. was still connected to the tradition. And so he's based in Pittsburgh, and this is where William Bickerton winds up. Exactly. Okay. So after Joseph Smith's death, uh, often, uh, many Latter day Saints know that there was this climactic debate between Brigham Young and Sidney Rigdon, and Sidney Rigdon loses. And Sidney Rigdon yeah, this was. This in Nauvoo, like who should take over for Joseph Smith? Who, exactly. Who's the successor? Joseph didn't make it clear. There was confusion about that question. Correct. Absolutely. And Brigham Young really had a strong claim. It seemed that Sidney Rigdon had a strong claim, but he didn't really express it very well. Sidney Rigdon originally was in Pittsburgh when Joseph Smith was murdered because him, Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon were kind of on the presidential ticket and Sidney Rigdon was his vice presidential running mate. And even though it's not necessarily a law in U.S. history, and even today, it looks good when you have two candidates on the same ticket that are from different states. And Sidney Rigdon was originally from Pennsylvania. So he just moved back to Pittsburgh to kind of gain his residency there while he's running for the presidency with Joseph Smith. He hears about Joseph Smith's death. He runs back to Nauvoo, has this climactic debate with Brigham Young, and then he's excommunicated because of the things that he was saying. He goes back to Pittsburgh, and that at that time, that's when the Pittsburgh newspapers are all trying to figure out, well, what's going on with Sidney Rigdon? They all thought, there was one newspaper account that thought, they said he's going to become the master patriarch when he goes back to Nauvoo, thinking he's going to become the leader. And then they have to issue a correction and saying, oh, no, never mind, he's back in our, he's back in our area, and we better, we, we better keep an eye on him. So William Bickerton is reading these accounts, and he moves to Pittsburgh, or right on the outskirts of Pittsburgh in this little borough called West Elizabeth. And West Elizabeth was a coal mining area. Pittsburgh was known as the Birmingham of America during this time. It was just really a booming city that was growing in the West, you know, on the, right by the Allegheny Mountains. So William Bickerton would have been reading the newspaper accounts of Sidney Rigdon. And like many Pittsburghers, he was just interested. He hears about Sidney Rigdon preaching in Limetown, Pennsylvania, which I believe now is Coal Bluffs, Pennsylvania. 
right on along the outskirts of Pittsburgh, and he goes to hear Sidney Rigdon preach. And we often hear in the Latter-day Saint tradition that Sidney Rigdon was this great orator, and William Bickerton actually confirms that. He actually writes that Sidney Rigdon was the best orator I have ever heard in classing the scriptures together. What would he have heard before? Did he come from a different religious tradition when he came over from England? He did. He came from the Methodist tradition. Okay. And that's, so. yeah, so Methodism and more early Mormonism mm-hmm. are very similar. And he's struck with Rigdon as being a standout among preachers that he's heard. Absolutely. Is this when he converts then? Is yeah, after one Rigdon? sermon, he converts. Oh, wow. And he sees Sidney Rigdon as kind of instilling, he says that he was never taught such a doctrine, which is interesting because Methodists in the early 18th century, this is where they're, they really believe in a lot of charismatic gifts. They can have visions, they can have dreams, but by the eight, but by the 1800s, that kind of starts to dwindle. Usually by around 1820, they say that that kind of, it became more of an established uh, church where they're kind of getting rid of this charismatic gifts where William Bickerton is hearing Sidney Rigdon and Sidney Rigdon is trying to bring those back in a sense where he wants to kind of show that he is a prophet, that he does have these gifts and hangs and healing and exactly. And, yeah. and he wants to have his followers have those too. So William Bickerton was really enthralled by that saying, I was never taught such a gospel that not only would you be baptized by full immersion, receive the Holy Ghost, but when you receive the Holy Ghost, you could be, like the Book of Mormon says, be baptized by fire and be able to have these charismatic gifts. And then Rigdon, he not only does he then become disaffected from the LDS church that's led by the Quorum of the Twelve and Brigham Young, but then he also begins to teach that Joseph Smith himself was a fallen prophet. Talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah. So Sidney Rigdon was a major player within the uh, Latter-day Saint movement up till the day Joseph Smith dies. The problem with that is there was kind of a, uh, a shaking of their friendship between Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon. A lot of that comes from when Joseph Smith proposed to Nancy's or to Sidney Rigdon's daughter, Nancy, uh, early on. And when Sidney Rigdon heard that, he was really upset with Joseph Smith, kind of confronts him and basically says, what's going on? Because Sidney Rigdon had never heard of polygamy up till this time. And that kind of goes to show you that even their relationship relationship then was kind of strained because Sidney Rigdon was always so close to Joseph Smith. So how come Sidney Rigdon didn't know about this? So you see the strained relationship. He confronts Joseph Smith. He eventually Joseph Smith admits to it. And Sidney Rigdon does not agree with this, but basically says, okay, if you're going to stop, I won't say anything. And that's what Joseph Smith, according to the, the, the Rigdon account, that's what happens. And according to his son, John, that's what happens. What eventually ends up happening is after he's excommunicated, before Sidney Rigdon gets on the steamboat to head back to Pittsburgh, Orson Hyde talks to him. This is one him. of the apostles, LDS yeah. apostles. One of the LDS apostles, and basically says, Sidney, be careful how you put pen to paper in this time of your excitement. Wait a few months and then see how you feel. Because he knew that Sidney Rigdon was quick-tempered, was had a you know was a great orator and also was a great writer, and knew that if Sidney Rigdon's angry, he's going to be writing these things against the twelve. So, but that's exactly what happens when he goes to Pittsburgh. He starts coming out saying polygamy is happening, and he's telling his followers this is happening, and he's saying that Joseph Smith was the one that started this, and. Sidney Rigdon actually starts to kind of, even though he upholds Joseph Smith as a prophet until the day he died, like we said, he's his vice presidential running mate, he starts to change his narrative and he starts to say, you know what, Joseph Smith is a fallen prophet. And in the Book of Mormon, there's this prophet called the Choice Seer, where he's supposed to kind of like be this last great prophet. And that's how they view Joseph Smith. Well, Sidney Rigdon is saying, no, I'm the new Choice Seer, and I'm going to be the one gathering Israel. I'm going to be the one establishing the new Jerusalem, and the 12 are apostates. So, and he even calls his newspaper the Messenger and Advocate, which was the original church newspaper name in Kirtland. So you see that Sidney Rigdon is trying to kind of bring the church back to a Kirtland style Mm -hmm. era, but he's still using things from the Nauvoo period, including Sidney Rigdon had this council called the Grand Council, which was very similar to the Council of 50. And he's ordaining people, prophets, priests, and kings with the hope that the millennium is nigh and Jesus Christ's second coming is coming real fast. So Sidney Rigdon is very much adopting things from the Kirtland area, but also adopting things from the Nauvoo period. So it's really a, a, a unique amalgamation that he's doing, and he calls the church the Church of Christ. Yeah, so he's going to lead this church, the Church of Christ, sort of 
suggesting that it's sort of the original. He's going back to the original restoration. And it's also a church founded on miracles. There was a fire, for example, that didn't burn their building down. Oh, yeah. It was really funny. Like the newspaper was like, well, if God's going to save your church, maybe he could have, I don't know, stepped in before all these other houses burned too. Sure. You know? like, <laughs> yeah, that, that was, <laughs> thanks, Blair. Yeah. So when Sidney Rigdon is starting the Church of Christ, which was the original name of Joseph Smith's church in 1830, they have a conference it's actually on the 15th anniversary of the original Church of Christ. So in April of 1845, they're in Pittsburgh. It's the second, it's the, it's the day before the last day of the conference. And they're sitting in their, in their meeting house in the middle of Pittsburgh. And all of a sudden they hear these shri- these shrieks and cries outside the windows. And they're trying to figure out, well, what's going on? Well, we know from today, it's called the Great Conflagration of 1845. The city of Pittsburgh was burning to the ground. And the city really was almost burned completely to the ground. So what they said, according to the Church of Christ minutes, was that they kneeled, they prayed, and that as they're doing this, they said they had visions of angels leaving the the sanctuary and going out the windows to go save and, you know, put the fire out. And they said that because of their prayer, this is what happened. And this is kind of what William Bickerton would have been reading about as well, because he hadn't joined necessarily yet. And and you see the newspaper accounts. Is it okay if I read that account sure. from the book? Yeah. It says, when the story of Rigdon saving the city reached the secular press, people were repulsed. These fanatics quietly pursued their mummeries while the city was consuming, the Pittsburgh Daily Gazette and advertiser huffed. Our citizens would have thanked them to have sent their he- escort of heavenly messengers a little sooner and not have waited until the fairest part of our city was laid in ashes and many lives had fallen a sacrifice to the devouring element. Rigdon's newspaper contained other strange things, the writer claimed, and promoted as many absurdities in this enlightened age as ever took place in the darkest eras. So, as you can see, the secular press was really keeping track of Sidney Rigdon, and there was quite a bit written about him. <laughs> yeah, and then pretty shortly after this is when William Bickerton joins mm-hmm. uh, in, in mid-1845. So here's the question then, if Rigdon is sort of leading this movement, given Rigdon's significant calling and his gifts with oratory, it seems surprising that Bickerton would end up leading the movement. What happened? Yeah. Well, Sidney Rigdon's emphasis on spiritual gifts was also a good thing and also a bad thing for him because Sidney Rigdon institutes what Joseph Smith had started was the School of the Prophets in Kirtland, and he institutes that within his own church. And William Bickerton was a member of the School of the Prophets. And William Bickerton says that within that school, they're not only reading history, learning languages, but they're trying to understand the gifts of the Spirit and also to, to learn how to be a good minister and to spread the gospel. Well, in the School of the Prophets, William Bickerton says that they're having revelations that Sidney Rigdon is going astray because in June of 1845, that's when William Bickerton joins. By August, Sidney Rigdon is trying to find a place to create the New Jerusalem, and he eventually decides it's in the Cumberland Valley of Pennsylvania. He's actually with William E. McClellan, who actually used to be an apostle within the, the, the early church under Joseph Smith. And then he says, ah, this is the place where we're going to build the new Jerusalem. But then he has this small cohort within the School of the Prophets where, where, where William Bickerton is. And that's where they're saying, no, Sydney, we don't think this is actually right. We think that this is going to go astray. It was and, called Adventure Farm, right? Yeah. The place where he had identified. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. They bought the land. Uh, they bought the land on Adventure Farm. The only pl- – what ends up happening is – sounds like a great theme park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it definitely was. So when <laughs> – <laughs> so what ends, up, what ends up happening is um, William Bickerton does not end up going with the few, with a couple hundred people that end up going to the Cumberland Valley to create this new Jerusalem. He's part of that small cohort of these mavericks that are saying, no, Sidney Rigdon's going astray. And during the last conference that's held in Pittsburgh, William Bickerton is having these revelations, according to his account, in the School of Prophets. But at the same point, you don't see him leave immediately. He's a part of Sidney Rigdon's Grand Council. He's a 70. He's also a prophet, priest, and king. And he's actually sitting in the meeting according to the newspaper accounts and Sidney Rigdon is lambasting the people who are against him and he's saying that not only are they, and I'm paraphrasing but he basically says not only the LDS and the ones in Nauvoo and, and that they're leaving, not only, are, are, not only are they against us but also this small cohort of these mavericks are against us and they're trying to stop Zion. So I can only imagine what William Bickerton was thinking at that time. He, it, the newspaper does says that they asked some of the people in the Grand Council what their thoughts were about it and w- William Bickerton says this strange thing. He basically says, I feel convicted that the Holy Spirit is upon 
on me or something like that. It's a very political statement. I kind of read it as where you kind of see he's he's debating what to do, but he feels by the Holy Spirit, Signe Rigdon isn't doing the right thing. And we see that he does not end up going to the communal valley, to the Cumberland Valley to create that communal society. So long story short, Signe Rigdon's communitarian society goes bankrupt very quickly. And by 1847, they're completely bankrupt. And there's this really dramatic moment, which I felt really bad while reading it, is that they knew they were going bankrupt. Signe Rigdon really believes he's like this last great prophet. And they actually go behind the barn on Adventure Farm, which is the one thing that they could build as their temple. And they're actually dressed in ascension robes. And all night, they fervently pray for Jesus to return that night to save them from this disaster. And it's in the middle of February. So we can only imagine in, in Pennsylvania, that's really cold. And they pray all night. And to their dismay, Jesus never comes back. So they're walking back and wallowing in despair. And a lot of people in the Church of Christ go bankrupt. And Sidney Rigdon has this momentous uh, statement where it's a recorded where he basically abandons his followers to go back to Friendship, New York, where his daughter and son-in-law live. And it's accounted where he says, well, if anyone asks to know where I'm gone, tell them I've gone to hell on a thousand years mission. And then he just leaves. Wow. So people are just kind of stranded. And some of them, according to William Bickerton's account, actually went and, and actually met with William Bickerton and were kind of coalescing around him and kind of seeing him as a leader. It was a small cohort. We don't know how many people were, but William Bickerton, a poor English coal miner who's not even an American citizen. Is and a not, new convert. And a new convert is not only trying to financially and emotionally you know, foster his family, but he's also trying to foster these people who've basically lost everything in this attempt to build the new Jerusalem. And you found, surprisingly, he ends up rejoining the LDS church, the Salt Lake-based mm -hmm. LDS church at this time. Is that something that was known in Bicker Tonight history, or did you uncover that? It was known, but it was very rarely talked about. I even talk with uh, some people within the Bicker Tonight church, who even today they go, oh, we never knew that. Mm. Yeah, and he was a devout Mormon. He joins, the reason he, so it, it might be interesting to say this, and this is what I found so fast fascinating is why would why would William Bickerton join Brigham Young when he was taught under the tutelage of Sidney Rigdon and Sidney Rigdon lambasted the 12 mm -hmm. lambasted Brigham Young and you kind of this is where William Bickerton is such an interesting character within American religion and with, within American culture in the 1850s in the late 1840s early 1850s this is when the slavery debate and the states rights debates are really coming to a head after the Mexican American War America gains all this land in the West West and America and Congress are fighting whether should they allow slavery in those territories or not. So you have slavery, states' rights, they're constantly coming to head. In 1850, you have the Compromise of 1850, which is this really complicated compact where they're just basically trying to keep the union together. And it's basically holding on by strings. So William Bickerton is in, not only seeing this happening within the United States, he believes in Joseph Smith's Civil War prophecy because Sidney Rigdon even talked about that. Yeah, this is a prophecy that Joseph Smith had in the 1830s that, yeah. that the Civil War would begin, South Carolina's rebellion, and then it would roll forth. It would become like war throughout the nations and so on and so forth, right? Yeah. And you say William Bickerton was very attached to that revelation. Oh, it very much. Seeing this play out. Yeah, we definitely see that during the Civil War. And it, I was trying to figure out, well, when could he have heard about this? Because we know that wasn't canonized in the Doctrine and Covenants until much later. But when you look at Sidney Rigdon's newspaper, sure enough, Sidney mm. Rigdon's talking about it. So he would definitely would have known about it. And he's seeing this kind of this cataclysmic event coming forward. So you kind of see, and you sympathize with William Bickerton. He's poor. He's got these converts around him that he's also trying to help. And Brigham Young is prospering in the West, right? I mean, the Mormon battalion was one was basically the, the people that found the first flakes of gold in California that starts the gold rush. So not only is Brigham Young a, the most successful Western pioneer in American history, and people are flourishing in Utah, but also gold is swelling the, their coffers. So you could see William Bickerton is kind of thinking, well, maybe Sidney Rigdon wasn't telling the truth because he falters very quickly and Brigham Young is prospering. Yeah, the success of it almost seems providential to, to William Bickerton. Absolutely. Yeah. So he, instead of sending a letter to Salt Lake City, he sends it to Canesville, most likely because he thought, you know, that was more like civilization. Canesville was kind of like the last stop of civilization before you reach the Salt Lake Valley. So he sends it to Canesville, which is the Iowa section of Winter Quarters, and he's asking 
for help saying, can you tell us more about your church? I have this group of people. We would like to know more about you. So two uh, LDS missionaries, John Murray and David James Ross, end end up meeting William Bickerton in West Elizabeth, Pennsylvania. And they know that he is a uh, Sidney Rigdon convert to the Restoration. William Bickerton, believe it or not, never goes back to Methodism. He really believes in the Book of Mormon. That's what's holding him to this movement. So he wants to know, okay, well, what's Brigham Young's story? Because I've heard a lot from Sidney Rigdon. And there are a lot of similarities. The scriptures were pretty much the same. Signe Rigdon believed in the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Book of Moses. Signe Rigdon actually talked about the Book of Moses in his newspaper. They believed in, you know, the same charismatic gifts in a lot of sense. So there's a lot of similarities. William Bickerton, though, really wants to know, are people practicing polygamy? Because that's what Signe Rigdon constantly brought up over and over. And during this time, because of everything that the Mormons had went through, the public statement was, because of all the persecution, the public statement was, we are not practicing polygamy, even though the 12 and others were doing that. So these LDS missionaries probably knew about it, especially because one of them was from Canesville, and Canesville, it was known in the newspapers that polygamy was going on. But they tell William Bickerton, no, we're not practicing polygamy. And that seems to be the thing that William Bickerton agrees with and says, okay, I can join your church. So even though there are minor differences, the LDS missionaries basically are like, well, these differences are reconcilable. You're more than welcome to join us. And they do. They actually start a branch in West Elizabeth, Pennsylvania, and ordain William Bickerton, the presiding elder. And William Bickerton is a devout Mormon because there's nine members that we we finally see a number of people that kind of coalesce around him. By then, there's nine members within that West Elizabeth branch including William Bickerton's wife. After 10 months, there's 27 members. So William Bickerton helped triple his congregation within less than within less than a year. And then when he finds out that polygamy is being practiced, and this mm-hmm. is when it's publicly announced, Orson Pratt, 1852, he decides, well, I'm, I'm, I'm through with that. It's not something he wanted to do or be involved with. And he had been told that it wasn't being practiced, so he probably felt betrayed as well, Very uh, or at so. least misled. So that's when he breaks from the LDS tradition. And, and now we can kind of talk about how his own movement develops. We're talking about William Bickerton and the biography of Bickerton that was written by Daniel P. Stone, and he joins us today here at the Maxwell Institute. So with a movement of his own, now separate from the LDS Church entirely, what sort of theological differences developed, uh, and, and what differences in practice developed between Bickerton's movement and the LDS Church in Salt Lake? Yeah, that's a good question. This is what one of the biggest things I found most fascinating while researching William Bickerton, because he was a devout Mormon. So how on earth does he kind of transform his ideas? And that's what's really significant, because William Bickerton did not believe in polygamy. As a Mormon, he probably, he definitely would have believed in baptism for the dead, because that's what Sidney Rigdon practiced, and that's what the, uh, the LDS practiced. But Baptism for the dead and polygamy are in a sense connected because it's all about exaltation in the afterlife and the idea of godhood or the idea that you could become a god in the afterlife would have been something that Bickerton would have at least would have had to consider in the LDS movement because Joseph Smith had talked about that in, since 1844 in his King Follett sermon. So, but because polygamy and baptism for the dead are all connected to exaltation, that's where William Bickerton says to himself, well, if polygamy is wrong. And that's what he believes. And if that's connected to godhood and baptism for the dead, then those two are wrong in his mind. And that's where he kind of, those things start to tumble in his mind. And he starts moving really towards his Protestant Methodist roots, but he's still holding on to the Book of Mormon. So the Bickerton's movement becomes really interesting because the organization of the church is extremely similar to the LDS movement, where eventually William Bickerton is ordained a prophet officially. He has a first and second counselor. He's going to have a quorum of 12 by 1862. He's going to have high priests. He's going to have, you know, elders. The structure is basically the same. Patriarchs, there's quite, there's little differences, but it's basically the same. But yet the theology is very Protestant and very much early Mormonism, Methodism. And people that read the book will also see Bickerton was very interested in the Book of Mormon and drawing prophecies out of the Book of Mormon as well. And you also suggest that although the hierarchy developed really similarly to the LDS Church, there was also some differences about how power was shared there. And this actually sparked a lot of internal division. So talk about how revelation in the church worked and some of the internal divisions that cropped up. Sure. 
William Bickerton suffered the same thing that Sidney Rigdon suffered, and even Joseph Smith in the early Restoration in a lot of sense, this idea that all people can have revelation. Now, William Bickerton is considered the prophet that's leading the movement, but that did not mean that there could other be there could be other prophets within the church. There could even be prophetesses. There could It didn't matter if you were male or female, you could exhibit spiritual gifts, and you could even have prophecy. All the gifts were open to everybody, and even people within the membership could have revelations for the church. Now, that of course, people had to judge whether that was true or not. But you see that very egalitarian idea is very appetizing and very exciting to a lot of people. But at the same point, you're going to get people within the movement that might disagree with the leaders. And if you get enough of those people, you're going to start to see some division where very democratic, like all democracies, even within religion, when you have that struggle, there's either got to be compromise or it can really cause a lot of turmoil within the church. So William Bickerton saw both sides of that coin. And you also mentioned that because they they were back east, they experienced the Civil War a lot more closely than the Salt Lake-based LDS Church did, and maybe even the RLDS Church. I, I don't know. I, I haven't looked at their reactions and responses to the Civil War, but it seems like the Civil War had a big impact on Bickerton's movement. Yeah, absolutely. So to, to answer your question about Joseph Smith III, they did see that as a fulfillment. Joseph Smith saw that as a fulfillment of his father's prophecy, but so was William Bickerton. And William Bickerton and Brigham Young, even though they're diametrically opposed, and William, I don't even know if Brigham Young even knew about William Bickerton. I couldn't find anything where hmm. Brigham Young missing it, but William Bickerton mentions him all the time and really does not like Brigham Young. He actually ends up believing Brigham Young is the one who starts polygamy, even though Sidney Rigdon told him that wasn't the, tr that the case. So even you see within William Bickerton's mind, he's creating this own narrative and his hatred for Brigham Young is quite quite strong and some of it is a little unfounded in certain circumstances but anyways but there's a great similarity between William Bickerton and Brigham Young in the Civil War because they're both seeing the Civil War as a pre-millennialist catastrophe and what I mean by pre-millennialist is there this idea that the Civil War is this cataclysmic destruction that eventually is going to spread to the whole earth, they both believe, and it's going to basically initiate the apocalypse, and then it's going to basically cleanse the earth of its sin, so that way the church, either William Bickerton's church or Brigham Young's church, can rise up, save the country and the world from total disaster, establish the new Jerusalem, and Jesus Christ comes down. So they're both seeing the, the Civil War as this major movement in America and within the world history that's going to initiate Jesus Christ's second coming. And that's really significant within American religious history because most Americans in, during the Civil War saw it as a post-millennialist catastrophe. Even you could even argue that Lincoln kind of saw it in those terms. And what's the, the difference there? The difference is, so instead of seeing this cataclysmic destruction that's going to usher in Jesus Christ's second coming, a lot of Americans who are Christian are seeing this as a war that's going to cleanse the nations of its sins. So that's a similar idea. But once the nation comes out of this war, the United United States citizens are going to be able to create this kind of like d democratic Republican utopia that's going to kind of allow for, you know, Christianity to flourish and Christian, pr Christian biblical principles to flourish that will eventually create the millennium made by man. And eventually, because of the spirit after living a thousand years, then Jesus Christ will come at the end of this millennial era to kind of say, good job, guys, you did it. So premillennialists believe Jesus Christ comes in and, in and initiates the millennium, while postmillennialists often believe that the millennium it comes based on people's progress through the Holy Spirit, but then Jesus Christ comes at the end and says, like, well, well done. And of course, the Civil War ends and Jesus doesn't return. And what does Bickerton do then? Because he was staking a lot on that. He was. And you kind of even see after the Civil War, there is some people that even leave the church. It, the minutes don't exactly say why, but it's very curious that after the war, there you see that you're seeing there's revelation saying, if you don't believe in the Book of Mormon, then you can't be a member of our church. And you kind of see that because they bank so hard on the Book of Mormon. Third Nephi talks about this great destruction. They thought it was the Civil War. So you kind of see people within the Bickerton movement leaving the church because the Civil War didn't turn out. Just like you said, it didn't turn out like they kept saying it would. But William Bickerton isn't really phased by that, it seems like. He sees this as the moment where God is allowing them to go to the Native Americans, to preach to them. So, and he, William Bickerton comes up with this really unique idea where a lot of uh, latter, a lot of people within the Latter-day Saint movement see Joseph Smith as the choice seer that the Book of Mormon talks about. And what the choice seer in the Book of Mormon means is that this choice seer is supposed to gather Israel, is supposed to preach to all the world and kind of gather them all together to create this new Jerusalem. William Bickerton kind of sees – he definitely sees Joseph Smith as a seer. 
because he translated the Book of Mormon. And he might see Joseph Smith as a choice here among the Gentiles, but he doesn't necessarily see Joseph Smith as Israelite lineage. He kind of thinks, you know what, there's William, Joseph Smith certainly had his place within the Latter-day Saint movement, but there's going to be another great leader that's going to be a Native American prophet that's going to rise up, and his name is going to be Joseph. And he's going to gather the Native Americans together. He's also going to gather all the 12 tri other tribes within the world, and they're going to create the New Jerusalem. So William Bickerton thinks we need to preach to the Native Americans to kind of get the word out. So that way, when Joseph, this American Indian Moses, rises up, they'll have already heard the word and we can kind of get the movement started. So he initiates a move to Kansas. And basically that is where the edge of Indian territory. So in eight, which is interesting, he's basically trying to reenact the Indian mission that Joseph Smith had established in 1831. Yeah. So Bickerton has some pretty intricate Book of Mormon interpretations that he's sort of trying to use it as this map for the future and, and have his movement follow that. And this is why he was drawn to American Indians in ways that even a lot of fellow Bickertonites weren't. And one of the things that you draw out in your book is that this is one of the things that caused a lot of tension for him within his movement and preceded some of the rifts and some of the divisions that would end up excluding him from the movement for a time. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people within his church believed in the Native American idea, but the problem was is after the Civil War, like you said, in the East, they all felt it. The, the economy was basically in shambles. You know, there was high, high inflation. They're thinking, a lot of people are thinking, you know what, we need to keep preaching to the Americans because we haven't even really reached them. While William Bickerton is saying, we can do that while we're going to the Native Americans. And he's putting this um, this emphasis on them because he thinks that once Joseph rises up, not only will the Native Americans be converted, but also the rest of America will be converted or those who are righteous. So he's kind of seeing this as a way to not only fulfill Book of Mormon prophecy, but in a sense, fulfill what he believes is his prophetic role. Does he have a lot of success with Native Americans? He does in a sense where he creates a society. Well, he, they create a town. So imagine these coal miners and blue collar workers. Most of them are uneducated. They go to Kansas, which at that time was the edge of Indian territory. And they basically create a city out of nothing. They call it Zion Valley. And you see a lot of turmoil within the church from the get-go because they, were, they went out there they basically were looking for funding from their uh, supporters out in the East. The problem was they get two checks and then the funding stops because people are just so diametrically opposed to this. Some people want to move to Tennessee. There's even talk of making a colony in South America among his believers. And William Bickerton is really hurt by this. And the, the followers that go out to Kansas, they have to suffer through this terrible winter. And the only way that they survive, according to Bickerton, was that they had to sell and burn buffalo chips to keep warm, which basically is buffalo poop. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. so things are going Things are difficult for William Bickerton at this point, but they're only going to get more difficult here as accusations of infidelity crop up. And there seems to be a power play happening within church leadership here. So talk talk a little bit about what happens. Sure. So what ends up happening is the their town of Zion Valley, eventually it becomes so prosperous that other Americans move into the area and they kind of create a town, which eventually becomes the county seat of Stafford County. And it is eventually renamed St. John after the governor. So William Bickerton's communal enterprise basically fails because the church sabotages itself, but it becomes this prosperous little town, the county seat, and William Bickerton's still trying to go to the Native Americans. Well, at this time, while he's doing this, there's this movement where Bickerton talks about... Um, he becomes close friends with this woman named Trifina Taylor. What a name, Trifina. Trifina. <laughs> well, he becomes close friends with her. She's in her, tw she's in her late 20s. He's in his early 60s. And... There is a movement where she's on her deathbed and she's married and she's got children and everybody's around the bed kind of wishing her goodbye, seeing her. And he's feeling very distraught by this. He goes to the creek and he prays and he has this movement of the spirit, he says, where he's basically told, go back in there and ask her if she believes she can be healed and she will be. So he goes into the room tells Trifina, says, do you believe that Jesus Christ can heal you? And she says, yes. And he says, well, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up. And according to the account, she's instantaneously healed. And not only that, but 
her other child was healed under the uh, the hands of Bickerton. So you see this friendship start to develop between the two of them. The problem with that is, is there's two problems. James Taylor, who's Trifina's husband, is jealous about this. Even though there doesn't really seem to be any infidelity or anything like that, it's a close friendship. He's jealous, and he's he first accused he accuses Bickerton twice of committing adultery. The first time he says, "You guys are having this weird relationship, and I'm not okay with it." There's like they would go off and talk together alone, which was kind of taboo in certain circles. Yeah, like that, that kind of a thing. Exactly. Like a man and a woman shouldn't go off by themselves and talk about something. Yeah, exactly. That's the Victorian etiquette of the day. Right. And William Bickerton, because of his egalitarian nature. He's disregards he, it. He disregards yeah. it. And it's kind of foolish of him to do that, especially with a jealous husband. Well, he actually is brought before a high, uh, an elders meeting to basically figure out, are you actually doing this? They decide, well, okay, you're not committing it. There, you're not, there's no infidelity. There's nothing wrong here. And the, the basically the fan, the Taylors and William Bickerton were reconciled, it says. And they were even friends. William Bickerton invites James and Trifina on a missionary trip to go around Kansas to kind of rededicate the members to the Native American mission. And during this time, James Taylor is, e is even pr like prophesying, saying William Bickerton is going to translate the sealed records of the Book of Mormon that are come forth. So you see a friendship is still there. But not long after that, James Taylor again uh, accuses William Bickerton of, of infidelity. And William Bickerton, in my, I kind of am a little critical of William Bickerton in this because he should have known that Victorian etiquette would not support this because he was actually brought before a council meeting in Pittsburgh earlier on for going privately to a public park in Allegheny with Francis Hunt, who was a deaconess, and people saw him and he was brought before a council. And the same thing happened, saying, okay, th there's nothing fishy going on here, but you could tell they're they don't like that William Bickerton is so close that he feels comfortable talking with women in private. So all of these accusations are starting to churn and Bickerton's facing church courts and people sort of questioning him and and he's being exonerated but he's also sort of being chastised and then at the at the top of this interview you mentioned this division that cropped up between him and and, and an apostle right mm -hmm. and who kind of took over for Bickerton how did that happen what happened there yeah so this is where the story gets extremely dramatic, if it's not even more dramatic with all the twists and turns of the Latter-day Saint movement, is this is where it becomes a major soap opera. So they're they're trying to uh, have a, a major conference in St. John, Kansas to kind of advertise the Native American mission, and they're inviting people into the East. As they're advertising this conference, this is when these uh, accusations of infidelity come about. And people from the East, including William Cadman, who is the president of the Twelve, the Quorum of Twelve, he comes out there and hears these these accusations, and he actually sides with the people who are accusing Bickerton, which is really interesting because William Cadman had always kind of been not only a close friend of William Bickerton, but also somebody who supported the Indian mission, who was the one that basically kind of turn, turned the church around, where the church was kind of going away from the Indian mission. William Cadman was kind of one of the major move, forces that brought the church back to support William Bickerton. So it's it's interesting, and we don't know fully why William Cadman had this about face, but he does, and he's vehemently opposed to William Bickerton and what's going on. So what was supposed to be this grand celebration of this conference actually becomes a, two separate conferences, one supporting William Bickerton, where they're kind of trying to figure out how to conduct the Indian mission, and the other conference is basically trying to figure out, is William Bickerton guilty of adultery? William Bickerton and Trifina both say that they are not guilty, but James Taylor is on the side of William Cadman saying, no, they are guilty. So the church is literally splitting at the seams. And how did he end up losing his leadership over the church? So this is all happening in 1880, and he ends up losing because basically William Cadman goes to William Bickerton's conference and says, okay, we need to figure out what's going on. So here's what we're going to do. We can have some type of council meeting and we can basically like a, like a, a church court to figure out what happened. And they say, okay, well, here's, this is what William Bickerton actually agrees to the church court. He says, but I'll let you, since William Cadman, since you're in, you're from the East, you weren't here since that was happening. While all this was happening, you can actually be the, the, the judge of this court. And what we'll do is, is we'll have three people from my group, my conference, to testify for me and you the other conference can have three people to testify against me to make it equal and then you can be the judge William Cadman goes back to his conference to set, brings these terms and they say no it's going to be all of us 
and we're going to have we're going to we're going to be the ones only conducting the 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 church court nobody from bickerton's side can do that and that's when they bring the terms back to the william bickerton's faction they say no way that's totally unfair and that's when cadman's group basically excommunicates william bickerton anybody who supports him is excommunicated and william cadman eventually goes back to the east to try to support his side and william cadman is eventually or ordained president of the church during all this so it, the church, it's very tragic, literally splits into, you have the majority of the saints in Kansas and a small cohort in Pennsylvania and Ohio and those areas believe William Bickerton is innocent, while the majority of the, the saints in the East and a small cohort in Kansas say that he's guilty and they support William Cadman. How did he remain connected to the movement then? As, as we mentioned, he had an apostle read from the book of Job at his funeral saying, boy, I hope, I hope I'm vindicated. I, hope my, I wish my story was written down in a book. How did he remain connected to the movement and how did he come back? Yeah, so for 22 years, the Church of Jesus Christ was split in two. And William Bickerton was very adamant about preaching to the Native Americans. Finally, at last, after all this turmoil, William Bickerton actually has major missions to the Native Americans. He's basically living among them. And that's one chapter of the whole book. It's really fascinating to see how William Bickerton just lived among them. And for the most part, they seem to really respect him. There was there's no major conflicts among the Native Americans. But eventually what ends up happening is William Bickerton's church is suffering. William Cadman's church is suffering. You read the minutes of both and th their church is just really floundering because you have two churches of Jesus Christ that basically believe in the same things, but they're not together. So the, the membership from both sides are really trying to push for the church to come back together. And William Cadman, to his credit, actually comes out to St. John, Kansas, meets with William Bickerton, try to figure out some type of agreement. They both can't come to terms. William Bickerton had tried twice before to unite the church under his leadership, and William Cadman would have none of it. So we don't know what William Cadman and Bickerton said during this third time, but... It, nothing comes of it. So William Cabin eventually comes up with another idea saying, let me send a friendlier face. And he sends this man named Alexander Cherry, who was an apostle under William Bickerton, but eventually leaves and joins Cadman's church later on. So Alexander Cherry gives William Bickerton concrete terms saying, okay, here's what we can do. The membership want us to join. You're the leader of this movement. So here are the terms. William Bickerton is his late eighties by this time. He knows he's going to die. So he says, okay, you can no longer be the leader of the movement. You will no longer be considered a prophet, but you can still hold your priesthood. You can be an elder. And basically, if you do this, we will forgive you if you forgive us. That's basically the terms. And that's how they write it out and saying there's no rebaptisms. There's nothing. Everybody will just come back together. There's no reordinations. And William Bickerton, knowing that William Cadman is almost two decades younger than him, he's in his late 80s. He knows he's going to die soon. He's got to swallow that hard pill. He has to decide two things, whether he wants to save his pride and keep, but if he saves his pride and remains the leader of his section of the movement, his church may flounder, or he can kind of help ease the transition and take these terms. And that's what he does is he takes the terms. And in 1902, the church comes back together. That's Daniel P. Stone. We're talking about his book, William Bickerton, Forgotten Latter-day Prophet, uh, published by Signature Books. So I wanted to ask you, Daniel, what are some of the significant differences that you see between the Salt Lake-based LDS Church today and the Bickertonite Church today? What are some significant differences? Some significant differences uh, basically is the theology is very similar minus the temple. The, the Bickertonites don't have any temple ordinances, but the idea of getting back repentance, faith, baptism, laying on of hands for the re, for the reception of the Holy Ghost, that's all the same. And Did they trace a priesthood lineage back to Joseph Smith? Yeah. Do they see that as like the only true church that's connected through that priesthood? Exactly. Okay. They, the line goes directly to Joseph Smith. William Bickerton's a little tricky. So what he ends up saying is, is that Within the Latter-day Saint movement, it's really important to have the hands laying on for the reception of that authority, right? So William Bickerton says that before Signe Rigdon went astray, he was ordained under Signe Rigdon. He says that Signe Rigdon had a direct connection to Joseph Smith. So therefore, that's how he claims the line. Okay. But also, his vision of the mountain and chasm is where he says where he gets this authority from God to be the prophet and to lead his own movement. After he rejoined the LDS church then, that, that mountain? It was, yeah, it was after he left the LDS okay. church he has okay. that vision. So you see those different. So you see those similarities where they're drawing a somehow a connection to Joseph Smith, 
But really, it just comes down to the temple ordinances and the ideas of baptism for the dead, the plurality of gods. That is not in the Bicker Tonight Church, but that is in the LDS Church. So those are the major significance. There's temple ordinances, baptism for the dead, plurality of gods, and obviously polygamy. Bill, William Bickerton never seemed to agree with that. And the Church of Jesus Christ's uh, official church website distinctly says we are not Mormon. This is not a Mormon. They yes. see that label as, as being the LDS Church's label, and they're sort of distancing themselves from that. What do you make of that saying like we're not mormon yeah that comes from william bickerton and that still lives on to today um i'm not the average bickertonite in a sense where i'm totally I'm, being a historian i'm totally comfortable saying that the church of jesus christ bickertonite is part of the mormon movement because historically speaking it definitely is and we could even broaden it out to be it more politically correct we could say the latter-day saint movement you know because other latter-day saint traditions don't like to be called mormon as well but it's totally, in my mind, totally fine to say that. But yeah, William Bickerton would always say, we are not Mormon. And one time he goes, we are not Mormon. We are Stafford County Saints. And he's always <laughs> emphasizing yeah. this. And the Church of Jesus Christ has always kept up that tradition just to kind of, because, but you see the theologies and they believe in the Book of Mormon. So it's it's always been a struggle from the days of Bickerton and even to, to now to kind of separate themselves from the Mormon movement. But because the like the LDS Church, the Bickertonite Church, De believes that the Book of Mormon is a divinely translated text by Joseph Smith, who was used as a tool in the hands of God. Some people say, I just say he's a prophet because that's a prophetic gift. That he's a prophet used by God to translate the Book of Mormon. So it's hard to differentiate yourself when the fundamentals of both movements are the same. Did the Bickertonites have any racial restrictions on priesthood or anything like the Salt Lake based church did? No, William Bickerton never barred uh, blacks from holding the priesthood position or African Americans. And he, that was something that really made William Bickerton unique. So he's ordaining women as deaconesses. He's not barring African Americans from holding priesthood. Actually in 1872, there's this really interesting movement. The little redstone branch in, in the Pennsylvania area is actually trying to bar African Americans Americans from holding any or being equal with the members and the conference William Bickerton is horrified by this and actually sends one of the apostles Joseph Ashton and tell and they write a letter and it's the way they word it is so politically uh, sound it's so interesting they they bring in scripture and they say listen just like the Jews who were blessed by God looked upon the Gentiles as unclean, and then they had to have that revelation saying that they were clean, so too have we been taught to look at, he calls them the coloreds, you know, mm -hmm. to right. look at the you color. The terminology of the time. Yeah, the, t the terminology of that time. He says, so too have we been, look have been taught to look upon them as like not equal to us, but the gospel brings them up. So even though William Bickerton never really seemed to have, uh, he, he really could have been considered an abolitionist during his time. Not that he was radical, that that violence should come upon it, but he really thought God was going to judge America because of slavery. Right. So, but he's using the Bible to say, no, look, the, the gospel brings them up so they have equal access to everything that we have. And you mentioned women can, can be deaconesses, and I assume that's still the case today. What, still today. What does that look like, and how is that different from, for example, holding the priesthood to where a woman could become president of the church or something? Okay, so the, the way deaconesses work within the Bickertonite movement, it's kind of evolved over time. So let me say this. You have in William Bickerton's church, while, while he was alive, you had deaconesses deacons, uh, teachers, and priests. And they were considered kind of ancillary positions to the Melchizedek priesthood. So he never had an Aaronic priesthood. He had a Melchizedek, but the structure was very similar to the LDS church minus the deaconesses. And they were considered part of the ministry. And even deaconesses really had unique uh, roles within the Bicker early Bickertonite church. So for instance, because of Victorian America, it was kind of con probably taboo for two elders to go anoint mm -hmm. a, a woman that would, might be older or in, that lives by herself. They would give the oil to the deaconess and say, well, go anoint her and lay hands on her to you know to heal her mm -hmm. or they also would say if they could if she couldn't get sacrament the the person that was a shut-in they would give they would bless the sacrament and that or the communion give it to the deaconess and say well go give it to her so she can have it but nowadays that the deaconesses don't do that what the deaconesses do now that's real significant is they set the table for the sacrament before every service and that's kind of considered like one of their holy ordinances that they do and every branch does it a little what we you all what the lds church calls wards we call them branches it's the same thing so 
It depends. A branch might have a deaconess set it before the meeting, but a lot of times it's actually a part of the meeting. That's how the meeting starts is they'll play the piano, a soft song, and the deaconess will go up and set the table. And it's kind of considered like this solemn, happy moment where you're just kind of recognizing the sacrifice that Jesus made. Does that happen each Sunday at service? Yeah, each Sunday. And then as far as women advancing in the priesthood, is it just kind of a, is there a doctrine about that? Is there a scripture about that? Are there additional scriptures in the Bicker tonight, by the way? Are there... Yeah, they now now they only follow the Bible and Book of Mormon. Okay. And that's what makes William Bickerton's story interesting. Like another thing that makes it interesting is that William Bickerton really believed in a lot of the Doctrine and Covenants. He even had his own revelation book that was kind of supposed to be used similarly to how the LDS used the Doctrine and Covenants. They, not only was William Bickerton believing in some of the Doctrine and Covenants, but this revelation book that they were keeping was also supposed to kind of help be extra revelations that are supposed to lead the church. And the church today doesn't have any of those. So so about women advancing, is, is there some kind of position on that? Within the LDS tradition, there are small groups of women who want to be ordained, for example, or or some people who say, no, that you know the church has said, we don't ordain women. What about within the, the Bickertonite faith? Yeah, that's a great question. That's what makes them culturally very different. There isn't this major movement for women to be ordained past a deaconess to kind of hold the Melchizedek priesthood. Privately, I've have I have heard, you know, I can attest as I've heard I've have heard women privately, a few of them say, you know, it'd be nice if we could be ordained to the priesthood, but there's not this major push with the leadership to make it happen where like the LDS church has, you know, the, the, you have cohorts that like ordain women and others that are trying to kind of uh, uh, broadcast this or kind of push for this uh, movement. Are there other things women can do? You mentioned that in the past they could anoint and things. Is that fallen yeah, away? By that's the way, fallen away. Well? So that's in, sort of similar within the LDS tradition. Women used to be able to anoint and 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 heal and do things like that, and and that faded over time. So that's interesting that that happened in both traditions. Yep, correct. Uh, have there been any studies of the contemporary Bicker Tonight Church that you that you know of? N uh, not really. It sounds like there's a yeah a lot of work to do. Yeah, there's a ton of work. This is. Honestly, if I could just tell American religious and historian scholars or scholars of religion, the Bicker Tonight Church is the one rock that has never been overturned. I mean, it's really hard within any historical uh, field to find a rock that's not been unturned, especially when you're writing a dissertation. You're always trying to find that little nook of the rock yes. that hasn't and, been talked yeah. about. But William, that's what was so fun about writing about William Bickerton. It was literally a brand new rock that had never really been un overturned to it's look at everything. Too, though, right? Because like, because you also don't have a lot of people to interact with as well, right? Yeah, I actually write that in the introduction, recognizing that that could be a weakness because you don't have other history. I didn't have any yeah. other historians to kind of base things off. So I had to quote, I say in the introduction, I quote liberally from the sources so people can see for themselves. Not only do I cite them, but I'm trying to show the people like this is what the sources are saying because I was one of the first ones I, fortunately and unfortunately to kind of give my interpretation as to what these actually mean. So as a bicker tonight yourself, what was it like to write about your own faith tradition in a more academic register? Did your experience of your religion change at all through the process? Yeah, I became much more open-minded. I always can kind of considered myself open-minded, but basically I am, my mind's wide open now. It was exhilarating. It was extremely fun, but I can't say there weren't depressing moments. There was a couple times where my wife can even attest to this, where I had even said, why am I even doing this? I spent five years of my life researching and writing this book. And I kind of, you know, every once in a while you just kind of get down because it didn't seem like people, some people seemed interested and others didn't. And some people were, were even kind of telling me why even write about William Bickerton, even within my own movement. Why even write about him? And you're not even going to have enough to write about him. And it just was really disheartening. There was a couple of times I just wanted to throw in the towel, but eventually after a couple of days, I picked the towel back up and went to work. And I'm so glad I did because it's, I'm thankful it's selling and people are interested. So I'm quite thankful for that. So you mentioned some of the reactions that you got from, from people within your tradition. Are there things in the book that are going to be harder for them to digest? Uh, we've Perhaps you've mentioned a few throughout the interview, but will this book be unsettling? And you made the comparison to Rough Stone Rolling, and some people have read Richard Bushman's biography of Joseph Smith and have been unsettled by it. Some mm -hmm. Latter-day Saints have. Other Latter-day Saints have brought it in like a breath of fresh air and really, really appreciated the candor and, and the different perspective that he brings. Do you expect similar responses within your faith? I'm hoping it's the latter where it's a breath of fresh air. Yeah. I've gotten a lot of compliments from people in the church, even people. One one person that's I really I, I, I appreciated her uh, candor. She said, I thought I was going to hate this book and I ended up liking it a lot. So that made me happy. I think the big thing is the William Bickerton and William Cadman feud. That really seems to be the crux of everything where everyone's so afraid. But to me, I look at it and I go, everybody's dead. 
I mean, you had a 22 year feud between these two guys. In the end, who really cares? I mean, yeah, that's unsettling that men that we might esteem as, you know, people of God that would be doing this. But when you look at history in general, I think it's just as a historian, you see that every religion, every single historical movement has that. So it's really no big deal. So I'm hoping it's a, a breath of fresh air where people can just read it and take it for what it is because I really did try to write it as a true history book. I'm really not trying to put in my own beliefs in this at all. I tried to be completely objective. Is it fair to say that the biography is sort of an effort to rehabilitate Bickerton himself? For Absolutely. Of church? That's Absolutely. so interesting because the colloquial name for it is bicker tonight <laughs> yeah. so yeah i will admit that was definitely the big the big push for this too i wanted to re rehabilitate william bickerton so you could say that would be my bias but the historical documentation supports that because the historiography of the church of jesus christ is so limited on talking about william bickerton so in a sense you know where some people might be like oh this is an apologetic work where you're trying to rehabilitate somebody it kind of works in my favor because unlike other religious movements that kind of talk about their founders in such great terms my church doesn't mm. so i'm kind of rehabilitating yeah. i'm saying no this is this is a man that we should we should be talking about and he really did lead the movement and that's the beautiful thing about mormon history is that biography is kind of snubbed within the historical field because it can be considered speculative or biased but within the mormon movement biography is terrific because most of the move, early movements in the, the schismatic churches are led by people. Yeah, James Strang and yeah. Sidney Rigdon. So if you're going to really understand the movement, the best place to start is to start with the founder. So biography is really works really well within American religion, especially within the Mormon movement. That's Daniel P. Stone. He's completing his Ph.D. in American Religious History at Manchester Metropolitan University in England. And I also should mention he earned his master's degree from Florida Atlantic University, and he's a deacon in William Bickerton's Church of Jesus Christ. We're talking about his book, William Bickerton, Forgotten Latter-day Prophet. So other than finishing your PhD, do you have any other plans, any other projects that you're working on? Yeah, um, I'm going to be writing a chapter for a book for Signature Books as to why I wrote the book, which I'm really excited that I was just asked to do that. I have a couple other articles. I'd really like to see, I'd really love to write an article about the Bicker Tonight Church as to when does the, I talk about in the book when they change from the idea that the millennium and Zion are one event? That's what William Bickerton believed, but the cat, but the Cadman movement believed that they were separate events, mm. and kind of go into later on. There's this big controversy in the early 20th century. They talk more about that, and they kind of make a, a solidified stance on it. And the Church of Jesus Christ today actually still believes that Zion and the millennium are separate events, but that's not what the founder believed in. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that because I'm really interested in millennialism. I really would like to look at Joseph Smith as the while he really believed himself as the choice here but when he dies there's this real uh every schismatic latter-day saint movement is trying to figure out or reconfigure well is joseph smith still the choice here or is he not signy rigdon thought he was the new choice here william bickerton and david whitmer thought this native american prophet was going to rise up james strang had his own unique ideas so i'd like to do something on that and i'm even playing around with the idea of a lot of uh, latter day, a lot of latter day saints, and a lot of the evangelical movement, a lot of people in the evangelical movement believe that Donald Trump is the American Cyrus, and they often call him an American Cyrus. And I'd really like to look into why they think that is, and maybe kind of look stop. I mean, it's still a work in progress, so it's not real. It's kind of tricky because I'm a historian, but I'm kind of looking at current events. But I think a lot of it comes from the, the fundamentalist movement in the early, the late 19th, early 20th centuries and kind of see why they consider him an American Cyrus and where do they pull that from and kind of end where maybe uh, Donald Trump makes the, the Jerusalem where the United States embassy is. You have a lot of possibilities then. And the last thing I wanted to ask is within Mormon studies, there are a lot of people who are Latter-day Saints or who have been Latter-day Saints who are practitioners connected to the Salt Lake based church. You seem to be the, you're the only bicker tonight that I'm aware of that's doing higher education, that's seeking a degree in, in American religious history and studying your own movement. Are you alone out there? Are there other people that you're in I, dialogue with? There are some people in my church that are really interested in history. They even have history degrees. But as far as I'm aware, I'm the only one that's gotten a graduate degree. Uh, I know there's one elder who has a political science degree, really nice guy. But as for regarding American religious history, I'm see, I seem to be the only one that's focusing on that and actually putting an emphasis on this movement. So, yeah, sometimes it's very lonely, Blair. I'm not yeah. going to lie. <laughs> That's <laughs> well, why I like talking to you guys. Yes, yeah. We're, we're glad to have you. We're, hopefully we help you feel a little bit less lonely. We're really glad that you uh, are here at the Maxwell Institute today. Thanks, Blair. Appreciate it.